Praise the Lord. Are you there? He said, Praise the Lord. The Lord touch every life tonight in Jesus' name. When you're coming to the Bible study, it will be profitable in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we bless your name for our Bible study. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love. Thank you because we're always on your heart. And everyone here and everyone listening is on your heart. And we're asking, Lord, that you do for us much more than we ever would expect in Jesus' name. Enlighten us. Lift us up. Encourage your people. We pray, Lord, wherever there is any suffering, take it away in Jesus' name. And confirm the truth of your word in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we're studying from Mark chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1. We're studying all through to verse 12. Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, immediately, many were gathered together. In so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come near unto him for the press, for the crowd, for the multitude, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the man, the bed, wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their face, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sin be forgiven thee. Verse 10. But that she may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, it says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, he took up his bed, and went forth before them all. In so much that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. The Lord bless the reading of his word. The man was sick, helplessly sick, hopelessly sick, terribly sick. He was paralyzed and he was impotent. He couldn't do anything by himself. Four men carried him on a couch, on a bed, like a blanket that they stretched him on, and they took their place in each of the four corners. They knew that Jesus Christ was there, like you know Jesus Christ is here tonight. And when they could not enter to take him to the presence of Christ, they went to the top of the roof, and they removed one tile, and they dropped him right in the presence of Christ. And Jesus saw their face, face in action. Like your face, he will see your face. And then he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. You know, if you were there that day, and you came to him, and they brought you to him like that, he would have told you the same thing. Your sins be forgiven thee. But you know today, he's here, and he's telling you the same thing. Because of his love, his compassion, that does not fail. He declares to you tonight, your sins are forgiven thee. And then, that's not the end. He now 
manifested his power to raise him up. And he said, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way to thine house. If you were the one they carried to him like that that day, he would have told you the same thing. Arise, sickness is gone. Arise, your infirmity is gone. Arise, your weakness is gone. Take up thy bed, go back home with your health and with your miracle. And he's here tonight saying the same thing to you. He's telling you the same thing tonight. Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way to thine house. And like we say, we are saying of this man, he went back not as he came. He came weak, he went back strong. He came sick, he went back healed. He came paralyzed, he went back whole, complete, and entire. He came a sinner, he went back a child of God. For you tonight, in Jesus' name. Tonight we're looking at this story and at this event. And I'm talking to you on total redemption from Christ our Savior. Total redemption from Christ our Savior. The whole event and the whole episode is divided into three parts. Number one, faith in the sufficiency of Christ's ability. That's exactly what Christ saw. Those four people, they had faith in Christ. And then the paralytic man himself, he had faith in Christ. And he saw that faith, faith in the sufficiency of Christ's ability. Number two, forgiveness of all sins through Christ's atonement. Christ, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. He knew what he came to do. And he knew by his stripes we're going to be healed. And before he went to the cross, he wanted the man to enjoy and to benefit from the atonement he will make on the cross of Calvary. And so he said, Son, thy sin be forgiven thee, forgiveness of all sins through Christ's atonement. Number three, freedom from all sickness in your life. On your wife, on your children, amen. amen. On every loved one around your family, freedom tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Freedom from all sickness by Christ's authority. Christ's authority. Christ Jesus has the power. He has the power to forgive. He has the power to deliver. He has the power to heal. He has the power to set free. Jesus Christ the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. You will not go back home empty-handed. Let's come to number one. Faith in the sufficiency of Christ's ability. Let's see where the chapter started. And what we find Christ doing as it began look at this i'm looking at it from chapter 2 verse 1 and again he entered into capernaum again he entered into capernaum what does that mean to us he had been in capernaum before look at chapter 1 verse 21 and they went into capernaum straightway on the sabbath day and he entered into the synagogue and he taught. He taught the people. That was in chapter 1. That's why again he says now, he's come back. He's come back. He has come back to you tonight. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised, uh, it was noise that he was in the house. Look at verse 2. And straightway. Many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And all those people, the crowd and the multitude that came, what did he do to them? The latter part of verse 2, and he preached the word unto them. And he preached the word unto them. Look at Mark chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 34. Mark chapter 6. Reading from verse 34. 
and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. See what he did? And he began to teach them many things. He began to teach them many things. Why did he teach them many things? Because faith comes by hearing. The faith to be saved, the faith to be healed, the faith to be delivered, the faith to be sanctified, the faith to be purified, the faith to be empowered, and the faith to go through life walking by faith. That faith comes by hearing. That's why when you saw the multitude in you, there was one thing to give them, the watch of life. The word of grace, the word of God. We're looking at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray the word you hear tonight will bring up faith in your heart. Lift up your faith. Increase your faith. Energize your faith, and your faith will not disappoint you, will not fail in Jesus' name. Why is faith so important? Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, we're reading from verse 6. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. If you're going to pray, your prayer cannot please him without faith. If you're living, your life cannot please him without faith. If you're acting, you're doing anything, your life cannot please him without faith, but without faith. It's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe. That's what happened to those four people that brought the paralytic. They came to Christ and they believed. They believed in Christ's ability. From what they had heard of the testimonies of other people, from what they had heard of the declaration of Christ himself, telling them with God all things are possible. Telling them, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Hearing that, they came to him, bringing the sick of the palsy, and they found the way to lay that man in his presence. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You can tell by their action, they diligently sought the Lord. You can tell by their action, they were not careless about seeking him. They were not haphazard in seeking him. They were not superficial in seeking him. They sought him diligently. Come back to Mark chapter 2. And I'm reading from verses 3, 4, and 5. Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 3. And they come unto him, bringing one of the one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come near unto him for the press, it's talking about a crowd there, the press, a multitude there, the crowd, the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he saw their faith, he saw their faith. As we think about faith, Number one, there's the action of faith. He saw it, their action. Going to the rooftop, removing the tile, and letting the man down. That's the action of faith. Number two, we see the access by faith. Access. They wanted to get access to Christ and bring the man in front of Christ and faith found a way. They didn't say it's impossible. We'll go back home. We cannot have access. We cannot reach him. We cannot touch him. The access of faith. Number three, the accounting of faith. Accounting of faith. They counted it down. They said, all we need to do is get this man in front of Jesus. And once he gets there, it is done. The accounting of faith. 
and tonight you'll touch Christ but you put action to your faith but you have access of faith and then you will account it by faith that this is what the Lord will do and that faith will work mightily in your life in Jesus name number one the action of faith the action of faith I'm reading from James chapter 2 James chapter 2 I read from verse 17 in James chapter 2 reading from verse 17 even so he faith if it has not works is dead being alone faith I believe in Christ I believe he can heal I believe he can deliver if he doesn't have action not works then it's alone and it's dead. Look at verse 20. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith without action, there must be the action of faith. And the action gets you to Jesus. And you say, I must get to Jesus by all means, and I will take whatever action is necessary. Would you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Look at verse 26. For the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Come to Hebrews chapter 11. And let's see the action of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. Things not seen as yet. The Lord told him a flood was coming. He ought to build an ark. If he just said, I believe, I believe, I believe the word of God. I believe the utterance of the Almighty. If he did nothing, that belief would be in vain. He moved with fear, prepared an act for the saving of his house. That's the faith. That's the action. He built an act for the saving, for the protection, for the preservation of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith the faith that did something the faith that built the ark and the faith that acted because he believed the word of the lord when the word of god comes to you and it says repent because the judgment at the end of a life of sinning. If you really believe there is judgment, you'll do something about that and you'll flee away from the judgment to come. Look at verse 8, the action of faith. Faith always has action. And it's a visible action. It's a recognizable action. And it is the action of that faith that the Lord will see. And then he will say, your blessing be upon you. Tonight, you'll have the action of faith. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. And then we're told, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. He didn't say, seeing is believing. Show it to me. Let me see it. On the naked word of the Almighty God, he accepted that. He believed that. And he knew what God has said will come to pass. And he told him, come out of the country where you are. And he obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. That obedience and that going out is the action of faith. Whenever God speaks to us, we show that we believe God when we act on the word. Appropriate action, immediate action, prompt action. Because our hearts believe in God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. Hebrews 
chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He knew that God had promised the land, the land of promise for the children of Israel. And he knew that if he stayed in Egypt, he will not have the blessing of being a partaker. And so action now, he chose. The choice you make is your action. And it says he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt. He left Egypt. That leaving Egypt, that coming out of Egypt, is the action of his pain. If the Lord is telling you, you're in corruption, you're in evil, you're living in sin, and this is going to bring damnation and condemnation. If you died in that condition, you'll perish and be damned and be doomed and go to hell forever. If you actually believe that word immediately without wasting time and immediately without dilly-dallying, immediately without thinking of this, this way or that way, you know the Lord has spoken, you will come out. That is the action of faith. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. When God has told you something, that this is what you do, the action of faith makes you to forget about the king, about your neighbors, about your family, about what they will say, not fearing the wrath of the king, not fearing the wrath of the people that might oppose your decision. And when that fear is not there and you believe the Lord accepts the word and you rise up to do what God has demanded of your life, that is the action the action of faith. And God always looks at that action of faith and he always brings a blessing. That's why it says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, and yet for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Number two, there is the access of faith. Access of faith. You see that those people, four men carrying the man, they needed to have access, and to go through the door, there was no access. Through the window, there was no access. But he said, we will not give up. You will not give up. I said, you will not give up. You must have access to the Lord. If you give up and you say, well, I can't get to him. There's no access. Every road is blocked, and all the opportunities are gone. That's not faith. Faith will make a way where there's no way so that you have access unto the Lord. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 5, the access of faith. You make sure you get to the Lord, and once you have access, then you are able to get the salvation. You're able to get the healing and you're able to get the blessing the Lord has for you. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we are peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that justified by faith. How did that justification come? Verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. If we are giving up, there will be no access. If we said, repenting of sin, turning away from sin, having the Lord Jesus Christ, becoming a new creature in Christ, that's too much, we'll not have access. It says, by whom, through Christ also, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God access by faith it says over there we have access to the peace of god peace comes through faith and it is faith that grants you 
access to that peace. Let's look at Acts chapter 15, verse 9. Acts chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. You know, you are going to have access to purity, purity of heart, sanctification, holiness, by faith. You have access to the peace that comes in salvation through faith. You have access to the purity that comes in sanctification through faith. Any, any kind of blessing you expect in. Any kind of blessing, spiritual for your soul, for your spirit, and physical for your body, for your life, for your family, any kind of blessing, you have access only by faith. Second Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 11. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Faith with power. Faith with power. It's faith that grants us access to the power of the Holy Ghost. You're saved. You have access by faith. Sanctified access by faith and you endued with power from on high in the baptism in the holy ghost is by faith it's faith that grants us access into to those blessings peace purity power peace purity power salvation sanctification holy ghost baptism we have access to everything all by faith number three the accounting of faith. The accounting of faith. Those four people, they were calculating, this man will get well. This man will get well. And this man in front of me will get well. This sister in front of me will get well. They already accounted each done before it happened. Why? Because faith settles the account and faith says it will be done look at hebrews chapter 11 reading from verse 17 hebrews chapter 11 verse 17 by faith abraham when he was tried offered up isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called accounting that God was able to raise him up accounting by faith that God was able to raise him up how about these four people that took the paralytic man and when they could not go in through the door because of the press, because of the crowd, they had to go to the roof. And the man himself, he didn't say, I'm feeling dizzy, I'm feeling dizzy. If you carry me up like that, by the time I get down to the ground, I'm gone, I'm dead. Let's forget about it. No, he also accounted it by faith. And he knew, once they get me to the presence of Christ, even if I'm dizzy, even if my head is turning, even if I die, I get to the presence of Jesus, who is the resurrection and life, I will come alive again. I will come alive. I said I come alive. Accounting, 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 verse 19, that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Even from the dead. He says God was able. Our God is able. Somebody there, my God is able. You see, whatever blessing you need in your life, salvation, our God is able. No matter how deep and died in sin you are, salvation is available and you have, number one, the action. The action that makes you repent. 
the action that makes you come to the Lord. The action that makes you to know there's no other way. It's the way of salvation. It's in Christ. And you have the action of faith and you turn away from your sin. And you believe and you embrace and you take Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Your salvation is sure and definite in Jesus name. And the access to get to Christ, to take every roadblock out, and to take every barrier out, and to take everything that could have hindered you, take everything out, you'll have access by faith to the multiple blessings of the Lord in Jesus' name. And you count it done. Once I get to him, I know it will be done. Once you are connected with Christ tonight, it will be done in your life in Jesus' name. Look at that verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. God is able. I didn't hear you. I said, God is able. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 25. It says, Wherefore he is able. Always have that in your mind. You have a request in prayer. He is able. You want to be strong. He is able. You want to be steadfast in the Lord. He is able. You want to believe in God for a great miracle. He is able. Wherefore God is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Thank God tonight, my God is able. I said, my God is able, will accomplish every good thing you desire in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 20. Now unto him that is able, unto him, tell me, that is able, unto him, say it aloud, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think able to do and those four people as they brought the paralytic in the presence of christ they knew about god's ability about christ's ability and they knew that christ is able if you know beyond any shadow of doubt like those people knew and you say my god is able you will not miss your blessing tonight now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or seek according to the power that worketh in us that power will work inside you unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Yeah. Amen. It's done in your life. Yeah. It's confirmed in your life. Yeah. Always remember when you go to pray, our God is able. That's what they knew. That's what they thought about. That's what they believed. That's why they had action of faith, access by faith, Accounting by faith. Jude, I'm reading from verse 24. Has only one chapter. Jude, verse 24. Now unto him that is able, able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever amen faith works out all things that are needed for us for heaven in our lives through faith we're saved through faith we're healed through faith we're sanctified through faith we're empowered through faith we conquer through faith we are provided for and through faith we are preserved let's go to point number two now 
forgiveness of all sins through Christ's atonement. Forgiveness of all sins through Christ's atonement. We're reading from Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. You might have thought that the man did not even ask for forgiveness. You know, when somebody is sick, he might be already thinking in the heart, how did I come to this? What brought me to this? Am I so helpless? Am I so hopeless that four people are to carry me? And I couldn't jump up by myself, couldn't walk by myself. How is it I'm this in this physical condition? I know I've been a sinner. I know I've been a terrible person. When I was well, when I was strong, I used to run here and run there. And I ran to dangerous places. And I ran to places that made me more, more, more than, more and more of a sinner. He had been thinking of a sinner. If I had known, I wouldn't have gone there. If I had known, I wouldn't have done that. If I had known, I wouldn't have defiled myself. And because of that thinking, Jesus knew. He knew his heart. He knew his thoughts. And the first thing Jesus said, all those four people that carried him, they carried him there for healing. They didn't know the inner struggle, the inner strife, and the inner sinfulness, and the inner sorrow, and the inner confusion. But Jesus knew. That's why he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Uh, look at verse 6. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. There were scribes there, they were unbelievers. Pharisees there, they were unbelievers. They were what they call doctors of the law and they were unbelievers. But any scribe around you will not hinder your salvation. Any scribe around you will not hinder the pronouncement of Jesus Christ, thy sins be forgiven thee, and will not hinder your healing in Jesus' name. Look at verse 7. Why does this man does speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? That's true, that's true. Who can forgive sins but God only? He is God. He is God. That's why he could forgive sin. They were looking at him like themselves. It's a preacher like us. Jesus is more than a preacher. It's a human being like us. Jesus is more than a man. He is God. The very son of God. And because they didn't know that he is God, that's why they were saying, who can forgive sin but God only? Verse 8, and immediately... When Jesus perceived in the spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Why? Are you thinking of this a blasphemy? Whether it is, it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Don't you know, he could heal the body and he could also heal the soul. It's as easy for him even to raise the dead or to heal the sick or to cleanse the leper or to make a soul that is a deep in sin to come alive and to, uh, to be cleansed and to be saved. Everything is easy for the Lord and everything in your life is easy for the Lord. Your salvation is easy for the Lord. Your sanctification purifying easy for the Lord. And your baptism in the Holy Ghost. How can I be baptized in the Holy Ghost? I'm saved. I'm sanctified. It's easy for the Lord. He'll do it in Jesus' name. Your deliverance and the breaking of every yoke in your life is easy for the Lord. It will be done in Jesus' name. In verse 10, but that she may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. What happens before that forgiveness comes? How does that forgiveness come? Look at these three things. Number one, sorrow for sin. 
I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my evil. I'm sorry for my iniquity. If you're still in a state of enjoying sin, wanting to continue in sin, forgiveness will not come. If you're still with the mind of, I like it, I love it, I will never leave it. Okay, Jesus, save me, but understand, I love my sin so much, I will continue. After the salvation, you'll never be saved. But, number one, there is sorrow for sin. Number two, there's separation from your sin. Separation from your sin. Once you are going to embrace Christ as your Savior, and you are going to keep to Him, be connected with Him as your Savior, you break the link between you and the sin. Separation from sins. Number three, shielded or shielding from sinning. He shields you. He protects you. After you are saved, that you don't continue in the sin. Forgiveness comes, number one, because there is sorrow for sin. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10, For godly sorrow, what case repentance to salvation? Godly sorrow, what case repentance to salvation? That's a person that says genuinely, I'm sorry. Genuinely, I have sinned. Genuinely, I brought all this calamity on myself. Genuinely, I went the evil way. I became a terrible sinner. And this suffering has come upon me because of my sin. For godly sorrow, what case repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of. Salvation not to be uh, reversed in our lives. Then uh, salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. Look at Luke chapter 7. Sorrow for sin. Sorrow for sin. You're so sorry for the evil you've done in the past that you say, Lord, give me the chance. Give me your grace and I will not continue in my sin anymore it is that sorrow for sin that makes your repentance genuine that makes your repentance real and that sorrow for sin drives you away from the sin and drives you to the savior luke chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 40 luke chapter 7 verse 40 jesus answering said unto him simon I have some words to say unto thee. And he says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor, which had two debtors, and one owed him five hundred pence, and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me. Therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. And thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears. She was crying. A terrible sinner. I feel sorry for my sin. And the tears were flowing enough to wash the feet of Jesus and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Her glory, that's her hair. She used it, she didn't have any other sin to wipe the tears away. Thou gavest me no keys. But this woman, since the time I came, I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My feet. The feet was not washed, were not washed. The feet were dusty. And yet she was kissing the dirty, uh, the, the dusty feet and wiping the tears away with her ear. My head with oil, 
thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. It, she didn't feel worthy to touch the head of Jesus or the hand of Jesus, or even the clothes of Jesus, but the very feet of Jesus. Wherefore, I say unto thee, as sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. She had sorrow for sin. I'm so sorry. I'm a dirty person. I'm a defiled person. I'm a sinful person, and because of that sorrow for sin, asking for forgiveness, the Lord said in verse 48, He said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Thy sins are forgiven. When you have sorrow for sin like that, I'm sorry for what I've done, and I will do that no more. Forgiveness will come. I didn't hear your amen. Proverbs. Chapter 28, I read from verse 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. He will just come, forgive me, forgive me, save me, save me. No sorrow for sin, no confession of sin. There's no forgiveness available for such a person. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsaketh them, confesses and forsaketh them i know the danger i forsake i know the doom i forsake i know the damnation that will follow the sinning i forsake and forsaketh them shall have mercy number two is separation from all those sins we're looking at john chapter 5 verse 14 john chapter 5 Verse 14, uh, forgiveness is not just a common thing you know, that I get, and after getting that forgiveness, then I go my way doing the same thing, you know, sinful things I did before. Forgiveness comes because I had sorrow for sin. I regret I ever did something like that. And when you have that sorrow for sin, and eventually you are forgiven, you are separated from those sins. We're looking at John chapter 5, verse 14. John chapter 5, verse 14. Up to what Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. This is the man that had been sick, paralyzed, impotent for 38 years. And he must have thought all those many years when all these people are forsaking him, I have no man to pick me up and drop me in the pool. And so I remain here. He might have been thinking, everybody has rejected me everybody is neglecting me because i was so bad and i can't get there at all these 38 years how long am i going to remain here and jesus came there and healed him and now he told him you know what you must be separated from sin because if you go back to the sinful life what things will happen to you? We're looking at John chapter 8, verse 11. John chapter 8, verse 11. She said, No man, Lord, here is the woman that could have died just like that if they had mocked her because they found her in a terrible scene of adultery. And they took her, they caught her, they arrested her. And instead of dealing with her in uh, with great hot fiery judgment, killing her like that, she would have gone to hell. But he brought her to Jesus and said, We caught this woman. Here is what she did. Moses and the Lord said, Stone her. What do you say? I want to hear from you. If Jesus had not shown mercy on her, if Jesus has not, had not showed his wisdom to say, he that has no sin, let him cast the first stone, that woman would have died and she would have gone to hell. And she knew that and she felt sorry. 
she felt sorry if i come out of this if i get out of this never will i do this again look at verse 11 and jesus said unto her neither do i condemn thee i can forgive the past but now go and sin no more number one sorrow for sin number two separation from sin i'm looking at first corinthians chapter 15 verse 34 first corinthians chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 34 awake to righteousness and sin not you see that after we're saved after we're born again after we receive forgiveness from the lord awake to righteousness and sin not second corinthians chapter 7 i read from verse 11. second corinthians chapter 7 verse 11 for behold the self same thing that she sorrowed after a godly sort what carefulness it wrought in you after the forgiveness after the salvation they became careful that's evidence of real salvation that's the evidence that the torch of the lord the transformation of the lord had come to such a person in salvation what carefulness is wrought in you yea what clearing of yourselves yea what indignation they were angry at themselves for the evil things they have done they were angry at themselves for their past carelessness they were angry at the sin and the people that made them fall into that sin it says what indignation yea what fear yea what vehement desire yea what zeal yea what revenge in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter there is sorrow for sin the separation from sin the shielding from sin shielding from sin now you pray to the lord oh lord shield me protect me preserve me so that i will not go back to those sins anymore psalm 19 i read from verse 13 psalm 19 we're reading from verse 13 in verse 13 keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins keep me protect me preserve me shield me from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me then shall i be upright and i shall be innocent from the great transgression i want to remain innocent thank you lord you have cleansed me you have purged me and you are preserving me every day i want to count on your grace and count on your strength and remain righteous so that i'm shielded from sinning look at psalm 119 verse 133 psalm 119 and in verse 133 133 order my steps in thy word and let not iniquity have dominion over me shield me protect me now that i'm forgiven now that i'm saved i don't ever want to go back to those evil things you shield me and you will not allow iniquity to have dominion over me romans chapter 6 i read from verse 12 romans chapter 6 we're reading from verse 12 in verse 12 let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body you're saved let not sin reign in your mortal body you've got the forgiveness of god through the mercy of christ let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body that you should be each in the loss thereof neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin let it be gone gone forever sin of the past 
and is not coming back again. Let your life be protected by the grace of God, by the strength of the Lord, by the consciousness of the presence of Christ in your life who sees everything that is done, hears every conversation that is made, and he knows about every event in your life. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Say it will not have it over me. Sin shall not have dominion over me. The Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 5. It says in verse 5, Who are kept by the power of God. Kept by the power of God. Preserved by the power of God. Protected by the power of God. Shielded by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time forgiveness of all sins through christ's atonement point number three now freedom from all sickness by christ's authority freedom somebody help me shout freedom coming to you i say coming to you will establish your life freedom for you in jesus name i'm reading now from verse 10 of mark chapter 2 mark chapter 2 i read from verse 10 but that ye may know that the son of man has power has he changed i said as jesus changed he has power on earth to forgive sin. He says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thine house. And tell me the word there. Are you there? Tell me the word. And immediately he arose took up his bed, took up the bed, and went forth before them all in so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. I thought somebody would say amen. amen. This year, the Lord will do spectacular things in your life. That you'll say, since I've been praying, since I've been reading the Bible, and since I've been laying hold of the promises of God, I never saw it on this fashion. This year will be glorious for you. This year will be wonderful for you. I never saw it on this fashion. You see what the Lord is doing here? He said, the man free, freedom from all sickness by Christ's authority. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the cure for his sickness. The cure for his sickness. There's cure here today for you. It will kill you. I said it will heal you. It will deliver you. The cure for his sickness. Number two, the command of our Savior. Take up thy bed. The command of thy savior of our savior number three is courage before the scribes don't forget the scribes were still there the scribes did not believe 
the scribe was looking at him as if, what are you doing there? The scribes were saying, this is blasphemy. The scribes were saying, nothing will happen, nothing will happen. And in the presence of those scribes, he was courageous and he stood up until all the people said, we have never seen it in this fashion. In your life, scribes will not hinder your miracle. Scorners will not hinder your healing. And the scoffers will not hinder your total freedom in Jesus' name. Look at it, number one, the cure for his sickness. We're looking at uh, chapter 4 of Luke. Luke chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 32. Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. In your life tonight, the word will come with power. Verse 36, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this, that with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirit, and they come out. And they come out. And they come out. You will not carry any property of Satan back home in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Somebody shout power. Anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Who went about doing good. He will always do good in your life. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Has he changed? In your life, has he, will he change? When you pray, will he change? He will answer your prayer. Look at Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. Mark chapter 2 we're looking at verse 11 the command of our savior the command of our savior i say unto thee arise take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house and immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 of that Mark chapter 2. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. When he was sick, paralyzed, incapacitated, impotent, helpless, Hopeless for men should mercy, and he carried him. Now Jesus healed him, and he said, Take up thy bed, walk, go back to thy house. Those four men were still there, and the man did not say, Come and help me carry my bed. When you were sick, they helped you. Impotent, they helped you. Now you are well. And the Lord said, Now that you are well, what others were doing for you before? Don't remain helpless and hopeless because you are no more sick, you are well. Begin a new series of actions in your life. Amen. Why did he say, Take up thy bed? Because he was no more a paralytic. So he must not remain a parasite. You are no more a paralytic. Therefore you will no more remain a parasite. A parasite is somebody always leaning on others. Help me carry it. Help me bring it. 
help me take it help me do that help me walk help me faint help me use this and use that no more a paralytic and so no more a parasite you will take it up yourself what you ought to do they've been doing for you now life has come now healing has come now power has come Take up your bed yourself and demonstrate that you are no more a paralytic. It will happen in Jesus' name. You know, maybe you don't have any bed to take up because what you are to take up is different. Look at what Jesus is telling us in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, And he said unto them, All, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Take up his cross daily daily and follow me now grace has come take up your cross instead of looking at everybody and say look at my cross look at my cross look at my cross take it up for me no you have grace no you have strength you connect to the strength of christ and now you will take up that cross and you will walk victoriously in jesus name I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 3, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 6, and we're looking at a verse, uh, looking at verse 13. It says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Take unto you the whole armor of God. It says, now the grace of God is available and you are a child of God and the courage of uh, salvation and the courage of sanctification and the courage of the spirit endearment has come upon your life you'll not be going to the prayer warriors every time help me uh, give me the armor and put the armor on me help me this one is happening that one is happening stop all that you're no more a paralytic you'll no more be a parasite in Jesus name the Lord is saying, he told that man, take up thy bed, and he's telling you, you are the one. You'll not be, you'll not be, you know, crying and weeping and always saying, I don't know why this is happening. The grace of God has come, and the strength of God has come. Take up your cross, you will do it in Jesus' name. And take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I will stand. I said, I was time. You know, somebody that something is happening at night, uh, something is walking in uh, at the window, and he saw that, then he'll pick his telephone and call and wake up the coordinator and wake up the group pastor. Uh, pastor, something is happening. Why are you doing that? You have the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, cast that thing out there. It will go out in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes uh, it is like a little challenge because the Lord wants you to use that faith. You are getting faith here. I said you are getting faith here. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the words of God. And therefore, because of that, maybe your husband or your wife or somebody is making a little trouble and this and that. You never think you should make use of your own faith and take up your own bed. And then you pick up the phone and you're calling somebody uh, outside the stage and you're calling them and waking them up in the night. I am suffering. Uh, I about the church there the church doesn't look at me i don't have this i don't have this you are not a beggar i am not a beggar i am not a beggar it says god shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by christ jesus i will have all grace sufficient for me and my grace is sufficient for you i'm not going to ask somebody from america from europe i'm going to not going to ask someone from another state far away i'm not going to ask other people and hey, you know what i'm going through here come and help me here this bed i want to carry it but i can't you can carry it you will carry it i said you will carry it the strength of the lord comes to you today the power of the lord comes to you today and all that begging and whining and crying and all that everything has stopped tonight 
it look at look look at verse, verse 17 look at verse 17 it, let me go back to verse 16 above all above all above all taking the shield of faith who will take the shield of faith i said who will take the shield of faith taking the shield of it whereby wherewith ye shall be able to quench you will be able because your god is able you will be able because the word of god dwells inside you you will be able because your face will not fail your face will not fail your face will not fail taking the shield of faith where we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked look at this look at this verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation nobody else will take it for you i will take it by myself i said i will take it by myself and take the shield of uh, and take uh, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god i'm coming to second thessalonians chapter 3 second thessalonians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 8 second thessalonians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 8 neither did we eat any man's bread for naught neither did we eat any man's bread for naught but we wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable unto any of you not because we have not power but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us here is paul the apostle paul the apostle did not say i'm a preacher i'm a pastor i'm an evangelist and the weight of ministry is so much and i knock at the door there can you give me some bread i knock at the door there can you give me something no he took over his own life he said these hands are good enough to work i will work somebody there i will work he was not a parasite leaning on other people you have two legs you can walk you can jump you can run you have two hands that are active and strong and you have eyes to see you have mind to see and i say lord that can be done in your community take up job take up something take up your bed and walk nobody will take it up for you again they have their own beds to take they have their own responsibilities to take and they have their own challenges to take you will take your own I will not be a parasite say it aloud i will not be a parasite you will not be a parasite in jesus name come back here now to chapter 2 of mark mark chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 12 immediately and immediately he arose and took up his bed and went before them all before them all before them all who are they all there look at verse 6 now and there was such a scribe sitting there reasoning in their hearts why does this man do speak blasphemies those coffers were there corners were there but the paralytic man did not look at them i will not look at them the scribes i will not look at them the scorners i will not look at them you are not saying it the scribes the scorners the scoffers in their presence you will rise up in their presence you'll pick up your cross in their presence you'll take a new job in their presence you will rise up and walk in their presence you would leave the christian life before them all without any fear with courage you are going to walk triumphantly in jesus name 
Look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Let your light so shine before me. Before me. Before me. As you go out today, everything you have learned, the new conviction that came to you, the new courage that came to you, the new power that came to you, the new insight that came to you, you will march out triumphantly. And then you will take up this new thing the Lord has told you before men that they may see your good works and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. You glorify God. Your life will glorify God. And your new activity and your new life will glorify God. Your new victory will glorify God. And your new dominion will glorify God. Take up your bed, rise up and walk, and immediately took up his bed, and he walked before them all. Rise up, and then you are going to walk in victory as you go back home. You are going to walk with joy as you go back home. You are going to walk in strength as you go back home. You are going to take up your bed yourself, and you are going to take up a job yourself. You are going to take up an employment yourself. You are going to take up something that you will do, and it is not that you're a parasite again i'm no more a parasite i'm no more a parasite i take up my cross i take up the armor of god i take up everything the lord has given me i go forth into victory open your mouth and pray like a victorious courageous conquering person because your faith is dynamic and your faith is going to work It's time.